the Lord has given us <clears throat> incredible provisions uh, for the battle that we are presently in. Uh, I call them implements of war. You really don't want to be found in a battle of any kind, um, not uh, or to be found without um, proper uh, protection and proper implements. And the Lord has not left us this way. The, the, the battle that we are in is called the good fight of faith. It's a, it's a very uh, specific uh, type of battle, type of struggle. It's not, it's not a struggle that everyone in the body uh, in this world experiences. That's why it's called the good fight of faith. So it's, it's exclusive. The battle, this battle is exclusive to those who are living by faith. So there are experiences that you have because of your faith that the natural man doesn't have. Even, and you yourself have, have experienced this, that there are things that you fight against and struggle with that, that's the good fight of faith now that you didn't before you, you were walking by faith. That's right. See, so it's an, it's an exclusive battle. It's not the kind of battle that every, every son of man, son of Adam, uh, experiences. It's only those uh, who are, who are in, in Christ. And so the battle, the, uh, the instruments of our warfare, then, have to be specifically designed. They're not, it's not like a multi-tool. You know, we have, I, I carry a, a multi-tool. It's supposed to, it's, it's supposed to be suitable for whatever, whatever task that I find at hand. Well, it, it really doesn't even um, uh, live up to that, to that claim. But see, the, 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 the whole armor of God, it can't, it can't be used, the sword of the Spirit can't be used for personal gain. It's, not, it's designed specifically for the good fight of faith. It, it can't be parsed out and like subcontracted out to other, uh, to other purposes. It's not like that. The Lord uh, designed it specifically for our warfare. 1 Corinthians 10, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 says, The weapons of our warfare, not just any warfare, our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Amen. In other words, you're not going to take the, the, these weapons that are mighty through God and in, uh, in, uh, impose them into a, a, a personal or a, or a carnal exploit because they, they don't transfer. They don't find, they don't find any, any utility in, in, a, in, in carnal undertakings they're, because they're not, they're not carnal weapons. They're specific to the good fight, to the good fight of faith. Paul also said in 2 Corinthians 6, 7, it says, by the word of truth and by the power of God and by the armor of righteousness. These are the, uh, the, the, the modes, the implements that he, that he works uh, within. And so when he, w when he confronted uh, enemies or when he confronted uh, brethren, or not confronted, but encountered uh, brethren, the, these were the things that, that Paul, what, that were always ready in, in Paul's hands. He always had these things, the armor of righteousness. Yeah. Because of the work that Paul was engaged in, both in labor and in fighting and in, in ministry, it, re, it required this armor of righteousness and this word of truth and the, by, the, by the power of God. But the, what the Lord provides for us in the faith is, has specific design to our present condition. That's one reason why that it's, it's so effective. Uh -huh. Ephesians 6 says that the shield of faith will quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. That's how, that's how effective it is. And Peter said, if you do these things, you will never stumble. That's how effective that's right. these, these things are because they're, they're specifically designed for our, our present condition. In other words, the implements of our war will never fail. If we may fail... But the weapons of our warfare will not. Amen. Now the weapon, here's some specific uh, um, conclusions or um, some th specific thoughts about the, this uh, warfare that we're engaged in. The weapons will not eliminate our enemy. You need to know this. Because no matter if you've been fighting for eight years or 80 years, you're, you still have an enemy. So resisting the devil and wielding the, this sword of the Spirit, 
doesn't mean that you're going to take his head off like David did, Goliath. See, that's a shadow of the truth. But a shadow only has two dimensions. There's another dimension to this good fight of faith. And the weapons of our warfare will not eliminate our enemy. The, the objective of the, the good fight of faith is to survive. That's, right. Amen. That's the mode that we're in now. We're surviving. We're in survival mode, which is very, is very different. There, you know, there, there's, a, there's a whole segment of, 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 uh, of learning, a whole segment of expertise in survival. People can, can endure extreme conditions but because of the things they've learned, how to survive, how to be sustained by things where other, a normal person would just starve. And people that can learn to survive. That's, see, the faith is, 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 a, is a survivor. This, and it's by this... Um, by the implements of our of this uh, whole armor of God. Another observation is that uh, the good fight of faith is not <clears throat> it's not just dirty hand to hand combat. It's not it's not just a matter of strength meeting strength because if it was, then we our our strength is is no match for the for the wicked one. He fell as lightning from heaven. Nothing of that sort can be said of any man. So it's not, a, it's not just a, a, a matter of uh, who's stronger. It's also not a, not a matter of a, a struggle of smarts or just an intellectual uh, superiority because he is uh, pretty crafty. <laughs> we really don't want, we really don't want the, the struggle to be on this level. It's a matter of resisting. And it's... it's um, See, we're protected by righteousness. Think about what a, what a wonderful provision this is. We're protected by righteousness. <clears throat> it's also not a matter of guns and uh, gun tanks and embattlements and, and bunkers and things like this. It's we're, we're, we, we are, we're surviving our tenure on earth. That's the nature of the good fight of faith. You, ha you have to see you're, a person is at a great disadvantage in a warfare if they don't understand the nature of the fight. And there have been all kinds of fights. I mean, just, just think about the, um, the, some of the, the battles of, of history of the Englishmen lining up in, in red jackets and marching in straight array and the Indians hiding behind trees and bushes and taking them off. There was a, they fought. The mode in which they engaged the battle was completely different. And one had the advantage over the other. Well, the Lord has spoken enough uh, about our enemy, about our condition, about the, the, uh, the, realm, the, the worldly realm that we find ourselves in, that we don't have to be ignorant yeah. of his devices. Yeah. And so when we, when we engage in the war, our enemy doesn't have to have the advantage. The, the, the whole armor of God gives us the advantage in the, in the good fight of faith. Amen. So we are... We are protected by righteousness. Romans 13, 12 says, Cast off, therefore, the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. See how unworldly this is? The armor of light, the armor of, of righteousness. It's not just like chain mail. It's, it's uh, we're clothed with righteousness. And righteousness is it's his righteousness. Yeah. It's an, we're protected by an imputed righteousness, a righteousness that's given to us, a righteousness that is gifted. It's, it's his righteousness, but we are clothed in it, and it's righteousness that protects us. And put on the armor of light. See, it's a spiritual battle. We're, we're protected by light. See, this tells us that one of, one of his devices, the enemy's devices, is darkness. See, it's a battle of of darkness, of lies and deception. And we put on the armor of light. Let's look at the, some of the specifics of the whole armor of God listed in uh, Ephesians chapter 6. The belt of truth. Put on the, um, the belt of truth. The, the, the truth of God. The way things really are yeah. is part of the armor. It's part of what protects us. Knowing the truth. Yeah. The truth about the world. The truth about flesh the truth about jesus the truth about god the truth about the holy spirit mm -hmm. the truth about redemption it holds things together yeah. you know things Amen. things um without without some central um point of congruity mm -hmm. things don't work 
things don't work well together. The, the belt, the truth is like a belt that holds things together. Secondly, the breastplate of righteousness. It's from, from God, an imputed righteousness. We're, we're, not, we're not protected by the right things that we do. We're protected by the righteousness that he has he has given to us. So actually, in a very, in a very real sense, when Satan engages the saints in battle, he's, he's engaging God himself. Because we're, we have on this breastplate of, of righteousness. And this does have to do with our, with, with our own character. It's not just, the breastplate of righteousness is not like just a facade that covers up what the, the bad that's really there. That's not, that's not what this is. Because it's an imputed righteousness. It's not, it's not a facade of righteousness. It's an imputed righteousness. So even though it's imputed, it's imputed, but it still affects your character. See, that's why John said, be not deceived. He that doeth righteousness is righteous. He did righteousness because he is righteous. And that's the result of an imputed, imputed righteousness. And we're, our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The message of, of what he has accomplished is what makes us um, uh, mobile and agile in this, in this fight. We're able to, we're able to negotiate um, the, 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 the troubles of uh, uh, the, uh, the difficulties of of this good fight of faith and the obstacles that are thrown in our way because of the, the gospel, the gospel of peace. You know how, you know, the gospel, it's not just a random that he said the gospel of peace in this, in this battle, because you know how much, how much better you think, how much quicker you think and are able to respond when you're at peace. The gospel of peace, it's an incredible advantage in the good fight of faith and the shield of faith whereby we quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Our, the substance of things hoped for will quench what Satan throws at you. The substance of things hoped for. Your hope is a great protection. Amen. And the evidence of things not seen is a, is, a, is a shield that protects against what Satan throws at you. So when he's throwing lies, what, what's the lie compared to substance? What is the lie compared to when, it, when, it, when the lie encounters and confronts evidence? See, the, the, the substance, it, it, it's, it, it just, just quenches. It just quenches the lie. The evidence just quenches the lie. There is no, it, it, it'll quench all the fiery darts of the, of the wicked. Very uh, 100% effective. And the helmet of salvation. We have, we have on our, what protects us, what protects the, the vitals of our, of our head, what protects is deliverance. This, the deliverance of salvation is what protects our minds, our, our, our thoughts, the helmet of salvation. And, and the sword of the spirit. It's been noted that this is the only offensive weapon, uh, the only offensive item in the, the whole armor of God. What, what God has said is our offense. <clears throat> now all of these things, the whole armor of God, all the items of the whole armor of God, and the, these other items that have been mentioned, the, the armor of light, the armor of righteousness, the weapons of our, of our warfare, all of these, when the battle's over, they'll all be transported with us into the world to come. <clears throat> they will not be abandoned. They'll not be forgotten. See, now there's other likenesses of this reality that the, we have the first fruits of the Spirit now, but we'll, we'll take those first fruits with us into the world to come, what we have now. And we have the, the new man now that we're putting on. As we put the old man off, we put the new man on. Well, of course, the new man's going to go with us. And now we walk in the light as he is in the light, and we will not stumble. Well, the same light that we're walking in now is the light that will will walk in fullness there. And the love of the truth that we have received now that we might be saved, well, of course, we're going to, that love, of, that same love of the same truth, we're going to take with us. We're going to transport it through, through our uh, experience of death or else his coming and our gathering together unto him. All these things that we have now will we'll take with us there. So, brethren, the, the implements that we're fighting with now, we will be laboring with there. The sword that we fight with now will become in our hands 
an instrument of another labor there. The spear that is used against uh, enemies here and used for survival here, it will be transformed. Just like we, he, will, he will change our vile bodies to be like unto his glorious body, so our spears and our swords will be changed. And we'll take them with us. And they'll be... They'll be, they'll be used. See, they came from God. You really don't want to leave them. Amen. <clears throat> there's no, there really is, there's nothing that comes from God that can be, that can be just left behind. Now, these implements of war are not, are not only for war. See, we have a breastplate of righteousness, but the, the, that breastplate is not, it's not only needed for war. We needed to be made Righteous. Amen. So it does more. It protects and it makes us acceptable yeah. to God. Mm-hmm. And the, the, sword, the sword of the Spirit, it, it, it's, a, it's an offensive weapon, but we also live by every word of God. See, it's a, there, it does more than, more than one thing. Yeah. There's a lot of things like this from God. Yeah. Implements of war are not only for war. See, our present battles are training grounds. They're preparations for future engagements. So our, our battles, our engagements in, in the warfare here, it's not just a matter of abiding the time. It's like Joseph in prison. And it, it wasn't just a matter of just waiting till he got out of prison. There were, there were some, some things learned in prison. There was, it, it was like Joseph was being tempered in that prison experience. And so our present battles are training grounds we're, we learn things in battle about truth and about fellowship and about grace, mm-hmm. about mercy, about long-suffering that you can only get in battle. Yeah. Yeah. War forces you to think and to reason quickly. Uh-huh. Right. So you, don't, you don't think the same on the battlefield as you do at home. Right. You think different because it's a war zone. It teach, war forces you to be alert and aware at all times. There, it's, it's, I, it's amazing. I marvel at some of the things that men are capable of in, in the war zone. Of feats of strength and of being, of, uh, being awake and alert and mobile and productive for days at a time. Because they're in a war zone. It's the urgency and the danger of the war zone that that brings this out in in people see so the battle's doing more than just survival it's teaching us and molding us and and tempering us into um it's tooling us in such a way that only battle can civilian life is starkly different than war than the war zone and there are um it, it can be very difficult the transition both ways will be very, very difficult for the warrior that comes, that comes home from the, from the battlefield. It's a, it's not a a quick transition just to go back to normal civilian life after being in the, in the battle zone. Our present weapons will not be lost or discarded. Our present weapons will not be abandoned when we, when we leave this world. We're becoming accustomed to working, see, battling with this righteousness and this helmet and our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel and this sword and this shield and the the armor of of light. We're becoming accustomed to working with these things and we're 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 being schooled, we're being tutored in a war zone by the battle. So our present weapons of war will be transformed into a higher and nobler instruments of labor. In the world to come, and so it, see in the in eternity past, as the Lord uh, purposed these things in Himself. I like how the Scripture says that He He purposed which He purposed in Himself. So as He as He consulted with Himself about the provisions that would be necessary for the the sons of Adam to to escape the corruption that is in the world through lust, and He designed these these implements of war. But he, he, not, he didn't have just the war in mind when he designed the breastplate of righteousness. He, he, he designed, he thought, he intended for all of these implements and provisions that he would give to his children for the good fight of faith, he intended for them to carry over Amen. 
into the world to come because God's purpose is bigger than me and you and it's bigger than this present time. The Lord is a worker. He's always been a worker. The, the, Jesus said, my father works hitherto and I work. The Lord's a worker. The kingdom is always increasing. The Lord promised this about the kingdom. Of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Not just of what we know, but in after the world passes away, we sit down with Christ in his throne as Jesus sat down with God in his throne, and the kingdom will continue to increase. This is the mode of the kingdom. Grace is relentlessly productive. Yeah. This is the way grace is. This is the way, this is, this is God expressing himself in abundant fruitfulness, abundant productivity. God, he, he invests himself. He, God's a sower and he's a reaper. He's a worker. He, he, he harvests. This is what he expects. He, when he plants and he tends, he comes back and he inspects and he, it, he looks for fruit. And when there's not fruit, he takes it up that it, that it not cumber the ground. This is the way God is. So do you think a God like this would give us implements of war that after the war is over would just be discarded and abandoned and left behind? When the Lord multiplied bread, he didn't let any go to waste. Gather up the fragments that there be no loss, that there be no waste. If he did that of bread, then when, see, as we're uh, passing out of this body and out of this world, then we're going, we're going to be gathering up our armor that there be no loss. And we're going we're gonna to take it. We're going to make our exodus with our armor. And as we are uh, translated and transformed, then our, our instruments will be translated and transformed with us. Yeah. Now the Lord gave Israel treasures as they, as they left Egypt. This is another, another uh, shadow and a kind of sort of a parable of our uh, exiting of the world. And the uh, Egyptians gave them, gave them jewels, gave them uh, gold, gave them silver, gave them bronze as they, as they left Egypt. And those treasures then were, they were transformed later into a different form to be used in, in the tabernacle. And so we are gathering in the same way, uh, we, as we gather treasures in our sojourning, and as we're exiting the world, we're exiting the land of the enemy, then what we have, uh, these treasures that we've gathered up, they're going to be invested in the world to come. They're going to be transformed. It won't, they won't just be set on a shelf to be seen the same as they were in this world, but see, they're, they're, going to be, they're going to be transformed into a nobler form, into an, an, an eternal form uh, to be used in the, in the world to come. And so these implements of, of battle that we are presently uh, learning, we're learning war. The text that uh, Silas read from Isaiah, they'll, they'll learn war no more, but now we're learning war. And haven't, haven't you learned that the, uh, the tactics of, uh, of the enemy's devices against us are, uh, they're, they're diverse. We might say they're legion by, by name. And we are, we're learning war. There, there, there is no exhaustive list that you can make of the uh, of the, the tactics and devices that he uses against us. And so as we are learning war with these uh, instruments and these devices of the whole armor of God, they will, in the world to come, they will become tokens of deliverance. Reminders. There will be memorials of salvation, like the stones set up on the other side of Jordan that reminded Israel that for the next generation that this is where the Lord led us through, the, uh, through the, the, the water from the wilderness into the promised land. So we will, we will carry with us, like the stones that were picked up out of the, out of the water and carried out of the River Jordan, we're, we're carrying these, these implements of war with us, and they will be in the world to come. They will, they'll be evidence of the Lord's provision for us. Now Jesus, John saw Jesus in the, in the Revelation. He said he was as a lamb that had been slain in the world to come. He was the exalted Christ, but in the world to come, in that world, John saw evidence of his earthly experience. He saw evidence of, of what he had accomplished in this world. He's, he, was, 
He didn't see, John didn't say, I, I, saw, I saw the word. He was the word. But John said, I saw a lamb. He's the lamb of God. As he had been slain. Now he was alive forevermore. But John saw that there, he saw some, uh, uh, he, he saw evidence of his experience in the earth. Now we are, we are being conformed to, to the image of, of that same Jesus. Amen. And so I can't imagine that when, when we see each other in the world to come, that there, there will be evidence of our, of our experience in the, earth, in the earthly places. There will be evidence of the work that grace did in us that we'll be able to see. Somehow, we'll know when we, as we're uh, walking through the streets of the, new, the heavenly Jerusalem and we see the prophet Jeremiah, we'll recognize him. There will be, there will be, uh, there will be distinguishing, unique uh, distinguishments of this is Jeremiah. And as you, as you keep walking, there'll be other, you know, you'll, you'll see, oh, this is Moses. It'll, it'll, be, it'll be obvious uh, who these, and because there will be, um, there will be, uh, ob, there'll be the evidence of God's grace in them. And some, part, of, part of that is the, uh, our beating our swords into plowshares and our spears into to pruning hooks. What comes from God is eternal by virtue of his eternality and so as we take up the sword of the spirit then the armor was never designed see for temporary uses so we're learning now to use the implements that we will be using there there will be no tempter there like there is here but we're we're learning the sword of the spirit and the breastplate of righteousness there'll be no flesh there to put off and to crucify that but we're using these implements of, of of war now that will be our implements of labor there there will be no world to not love there there will be no darkness there will be no dangers there but see we're we're being schooled we're being tutored we're becoming accustomed to these provisions that the lord has given us Think of all of the energy that we are now devoting to the fight. All of the of resisting and of putting off and of putting on and uh, setting your mind and thinking on these things and running the race and and uh, so much so much energy is is devoted to uh, to this survival mode because of all the things that are against us. Well, all, just think about all of that being reallocated in the world to come. Just think about the, the, the instant uh, um, advantage that we will experience just by the reallocation of all that energy. To say nothing of the fact that we will know even as we are known. And that we shall see his face, not in a glass dimly. And that there will there will be will be in a body that's like unto his glorious body. See, Paul the apostle, he brought with him some of the things that Saul of Tarsus had learned. When Paul, when Saul became Paul, he didn't just empty his memory, because he had been he had learned the things <clears throat> that came from God. He studied the holy law. The things about sacrifice and atonement, the things about offering of blood, the things about intercession and representation, the things about the atonement day, the things about the holiest place, the things about God that he had learned, he, he brought with him. There were, there were obviously a lot of things that he left behind. He said those, forgetting those things which are behind. But see, there was discretion involved, and he brought over with him what needed to be brought over. Over the conversion experience. And so, likewise, our transition from the lower earthly places to that world, with discretion, we will bring with us what is profitable and usable, that which uh, came, came from God. See, Joseph never did forget Potiphar's house. When he was put over Potiphar's house and everything flourished, he didn't forget that. 
and he never did. <clears throat> he brought the, the uh, prison house experience. He brought that experience with him to the throne. Because yeah. he was learning. Yeah. He didn't go straight from his father's house mm-hmm. to Pharaoh's house. He went from his father's house to Potiphar's house to the prison house, and then he went to Pharaoh's house because it was too big to go directly from his father's house to Pharaoh's house. There were some things that he had to learn. There were some tools that he had to become accustomed with. There were some thoughts that he needed to be able to think that he learned to think in Potiphar's house and in the prison house, and, he did, and so he, he took them with him. See, he wasn't... He, he was a... He was, he was more of a ruler, more of a steward in the prison house than he was in Potiphar's house yeah. because, of his, because of his learning, because of his experience there. And so by the time the, by the, time the, um, the, the, the right time had come for him to, to take the throne and be second in the kingdom, then he was, he was ready. Yeah. And he brought those experiences with him. The stewards who were put over cities, they didn't throw out all their instruments of stewards of stewardship when all they had was talents. They were put over cities because they were faithful with talents and they used the same principles of faithfulness and the same principles of truth Mm -hmm. and the same principles that they used in talents when they weren't their own. They used those same principles when they were set over cities because as the Lord said, he that is faithful in few things will be faithful in much. And so he that's faithful in war will be faithful in labor. He that's faithful now with these things that the Lord has given, he will will be faithful uh, with them in the world to come. Jesus said things like, fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. See, he was referring to that time when your sword would be beat into a plowshare to give you the kingdom. He was referring to that time when the spear would be beat into a pruning hook. But the Lord doesn't give his kingdom to people who are not ready to take the kingdom. He gives the king. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom when you're able to take the kingdom. He doesn't see he doesn't let he doesn't allow you by his own discretion, he doesn't allow you to be tempted above that you're able to bear. And so he doesn't he doesn't give. He by his own discretion, he decides what this brother's able to bear, what that sister's able to bear. Just imagine how, how different life would be. What a, what a burden life would be if he left that discretion up to us. Yeah. Well, you can, you can only imagine. We, what, what trials would you choose to undergo if it was left up to your discretion? Yeah. Oh, I think I'll. See? <laughs> The, the Lord knows. There's nothing, there's nothing hid. Uh, when he says that we will know even as we are known, that, that involves our own inward parts. We don't know what we are able. Because we're being made in, in his image. See, so he, um, it's the Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom because he's going to give it to us when we're able to take it. And we're being made able by our present engagements in war. See, the kingdom is too great. Taking the kingdom is too great. It's too high. It's too grand to be, uh, to to come uh, suddenly without preparation. Just like Joseph had different stages of preparation. And some in the uh, uh, the prison house was about 13 years, wasn't it? There was uh, some significant uh, segments of time that Joseph was, uh, was being prepared. David, likewise, he learned you know, from the experience of the lion and the bear. He, applied, he brought that experience with him to the battlefield of Goliath. And even long before David ever took the throne, Samuel anointed him, and it was declared that David would be set over, the, over Israel as king. He was, being, he was being prepared. He was being tooled. He was being made ready. And so when the time came, then it was God's good pleasure to give David the kingdom. The kingdom is too great. We won't take the kingdom before we're ready. But we will take it when we're ready. And we're being made ready by um, our present engagements in war with these instruments of war. Daniel said many times in his his, uh, prophecy, this is part of of his prophecy that made him uh, sick and lay lay in his bed 
He said the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Just imagine. Mortals, not mortal anymore. But taking the kingdom. We will find at that time when the saints possess the kingdom, we will find ourselves well equipped for the work we will find that we are thoroughly familiar with the means of taking the kingdom. See, now, no one, no one is going to respond like the, in that time when, the, when the, the Lord gives you the kingdom, to take the kingdom, nobody's going to respond like the apostles did. Lord, increase our faith. Because they, they felt themselves at that moment quite inadequate of what the Lord had, had given them to do, to forgive 70 times 7. Lord, Increase our faith. Because they, they saw themselves as inferior to, the, to, uh, to what the Lord was requiring of them. No one in the world to come is going to draw back from what the Lord gives them. Because they will find that the instruments of war that they became familiar with in this world will still be in, transformed and still be at their disposal for taking the kingdom there. We'll be, we'll be already familiar with with them because it'll it'll be our sword that we've already that we've already been uh, familiar with that we will uh, labor with there <clears throat> jesus promised he he that overcomes will sit down with me in my throne as i also overcame and sat down with my father in his throne and we'll be we'll be suited to sitting down with him in his throne and whatever, whatever uh, uh, eternal and noble task that the Lord commissions us on from the throne, we'll be, we'll be able, as the angels who, uh, who are quick and swift to do his will, we will be, we'll be able to take that commission and go accomplish it to the glory of God and to, to carry out his work because we're, we're learning to do that now by wielding the sword and the spear and the helmet and the gospel, the, our feet shod. We're becoming accustomed to working with the provisions of God, becoming uh, aware uh, of them. In, in the, the, the Revelation, at the end of the Revelation, it says that his, his servants shall see his face and shall serve him day and night. Well, don't you have, don't you find in yourself a desire to serve him more consistently? To serve the Lord with greater productivity, to serve him with greater fervency, to serve him with greater... Uh, greater fruitfulness, then remember this promise that in the world to come you will you'll serve him day and night. And in fact, there, there, won't, there, there will be little to distinguish between day and night the, because the gates of the city will never close. There, there will be no night in the, in the city. Being able to, <clears throat> there we will be able to productively, productively serve the Lord without interruption. Amen. Yeah. See, that's an experience that none of us have tasted of. In this world, but what we've we've begun, we're we're moving in that direction because we we have a desire to do that. We will be able to serve without without digression. In that world, we'll be able to serve without retreat. In that world, his servant shall serve him day and night, because the swords will be beat into plowshares and the spears into pruning hook. So I'll leave you with a few exhortations here. I should call them conclusions since we have a designated exhorter. <clears throat> a few <clears throat> conclusions. So then, because the specifically it says that we'll beat our swords into plowshares. And obviously the sword is the, the, the word of God. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. And in the revelation, out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. So this has to do with with his, with his word. So receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. See, the, the word as you, at now, our experience is receiving the word, it's being engrafted. Yeah. It's being engrafted into your mind. It's being engrafted into your thoughts. It's being engrafted into your heart, into your, into your soul. And so, see, as, as time progresses, the, there's a, the process of engrafting over time eliminates the differences between the two units. And so an engrafted tree, there's no... See, in the beginning stages of engraftment, there's bands, you know, that tie the two together. But over time, as you receive the engrafted word, the two, the two grow together, the two become one. So receive, receive the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul, because the, the word that you're receiving now 
is, it will be the instrument of your labor there. The word that you're receiving now, that you, that word that you can, that you've hidden in your heart, that word is, will be the instrument of your labor in the world to come. Now, doesn't, doesn't that uh, just put a, uh, uh, put a, a handle, a bigger handle on re- receiving the word in the, uh, because that word is going to translate, it's going to transfer and directly affect our labors in the world to come. Well, it's no wonder Jesus said, Yea, rather, blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Because the word that you keep is the word that will become your labor in the world to come. You're going to beat that sword into a plowshare in the world to come. And so, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In all, in all wisdom. Because as it, as it dwells, and <clears throat> see the word of God, it also effectually works in them that believe. That's what Paul said to the Thessalonians. You, they receive the word, and it effectually works in them that believe. So the, the word of God comes, and it has, uh, it has an agenda. The Lord said, my word will not return unto me void, but it will accomplish that for which I have sent it. And so as the Lord sends it, you let it... You let it um, dwell in you richly mm-hmm. see the word is doing his work That's right. as an ambassador from the from the heavenly places it's doing his work and as you let it dwell in you richly you are uh, increasingly and incrementally becoming able to uh, to move into your inheritance yeah. to move into your eternal work in in the world to come as you let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So I, I trust that uh, these things have been, uh, been an advantage to you and been profitable. I, <clears throat> I, uh, I've been uh, blessed in thinking of this. And this has um, uh, particularly has uh, put another, another uh, layer of savor for me in, our, in, in my present engagements in, uh, in taking in the Word of God and, and meditating on the Word of God, ruminating on the, the Word of God, and to, to know in myself that my present labor in the Word of God is directly connected to my inheritance in the world to come. Because this sword that I'm using now and becoming, becoming familiar with, is, it's, the, it's the same implement that I'll use in the world to come. So I, I leave you with those thoughts, brother. Amen. Amen.